For the love of Christ urges us on because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if everyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. This is the word of life. God. Well, it's a pleasure to be here after not being around much for eight years. I was busy doing something else, but it's nice to be back, and uh, thank you for welcoming the Venable Family Traveling Show this morning. Um, my parents skipped round table today because they were limbering up for their liturgical dance, which will occur after, after we receive the new members uh, that we will be receiving today. So, no, no, those, those poor people have had to put, with me, put up with me for so long, but it is great to be here. The music, at least, has been really good today so far. I don't know how the rest of it is going to go, but the music has been wonderful. And simple song, My Foot, that was, that's a really hard song to sing. <laughs> I also just want to say, I know it's not time for announcements, but I went to see the Bay Troop show, and it was really good. It really was good. And you have one more time to see it today at 2.30. It'll be the best $10 you spend all weekend. I started thinking with my family about how Will Duncan is playing the part of Jesus. Now, Will's mother is named Mary. <laughs> so for us, where does that leave Cliff? <laughs> I don't know where you are, Cliff, but I think you need to de demand a little bit more respect around this place. Um, you're at least Joseph or God. Okay, if you didn't get it, that's, yeah, okay. Well, this scripture is all about the new creation, and your regular pastor informed me that this is the beginning of a series, which I don't believe I'm going to quite uh, do justice on, uh, but when David comes back next week, you'll get the full integrated uh, theme there, but I came up with a title that I thought would fit, and as often happens in the several days that I used to put the sermon together, it kind of went a different direction. But we are all growing in the garden of God. Hopefully we're growing, um, and we are all in the garden together. We are all different kinds of plants. We are, some of us are great, big, and tall. Some of us are very small. Some of us bloom for a day, and some of us are perennials who come back every year and some of us can be weeds sometimes can't we we can all be a weed once in a while so david's going to be talking about this book gardening mercies by laurie kaler and i'm i don't know much about the book but i know there are going to be lots of nature metaphors and you'll you read in the word this week that you get to take home a sapling if you like today to go home and dig a hole and try to get a tree growing in your yard or your pot, if you live in an apartment, I guess. And so you can start thinking about how God is tending a new creation in you. J. Paul Sampley is a commentator who said, if the most important single factor about any of our lives is God's having reconciled us to our very selves, then the proper celebration of our reconciliation is to share it with others by fostering atonement and reconciliation wherever we can. You remember from your confirmation class when you learned about Wesley's theology that atonement can be remembered by thinking about at one meant. If you are at one with something or someone else, you are in unity with it. If you're at one with God, 
congratulations. Uh, help me with that, please. If you are at one with God, you've done a very good job of being open to God's spirit. If you are at one with another person or with a group, you have reconciled. You have put your differences aside and you have said, no matter what happens, we are together. We are a unit. This passage is also about God's grace. And Sampley says it does claim us, grace does claim us, but it claims us in a way that enables us to fully and freely embrace it. Grace is perhaps better thought of as stewardship rather than as a possession. God, to whom everything belongs by virtue of divine creation and preservation, shares everything with believers. So these transformations that we thought about so much on Easter Sunday last week. And by the way, good for you for coming to church the Sunday after Easter. This may be the least attended Sunday in all of Christendom, but I know you wanted to come and hear the greatest preacher ever in Methodism. <laughs> Who wrote that? Who wrote that? Um, many of you, it got you here, right? Many of you watched me grow up, so you know all my balls and foibles, but. Looking out, I, I was counting retired pastors as the anthem was going, and it's just a little intimidating to know that there are a lot of people out here today who know how to do this a lot better than I do, but um, I know you're behind me, or really in front of me. So, so we think about these transformations on Easter Sunday. Christ obviously was transformed, and we are to be transformed in this new creation. We are the Easter people. We sing the happy songs now. We get to sing Alleluia. We are supposed to be new creations in Christ. Not unlike when you were baptized, you were made a new creation because you accepted, or your parents accepted for you, the grace that was given to you by God through Christ. You may not remember your baptism. I don't remember mine. I was two years old. I know it happened right there where the piano is. And I have a picture of myself as a fat baby with a shock of black hair. And there's a man standing there next to a woman in a very short polyester dress. The man has dark brown wavy hair just waving all over the place. And a very nice older sister who went along with everything so nicely. I have that picture in my photo album, but I don't remember it at all. But maybe you were not two, day, two months old, maybe you were 12, or maybe you were 15, or maybe you were 40, or maybe you were 65 when you were baptized. Do you remember that day? Were you, did you hold your nose and get dunked somewhere? Or did you feel those droplets of water trickling down your nice hairdo onto your nice dress or suit that day? Do you remember feeling different? after your baptism? Probably not. You probably thought, I'm supposed to feel different, but I still feel like the same old gooberish person I was before I walked down the aisle. We spend the rest of our lives embracing the fact that we are a new creation, and we're not supposed to behave the way we did before. When we are transformed, there are new expectations of us. We're supposed to be a little bit better people and treat each other a little bit better, and remember that there is God in every person you meet, whether you like them or not. Some of the good news about Christianity and about the love we learn from Christ is that we don't have to like everybody. What a relief. <laughs> but we do have to love everybody. Sort of like when all those people come to your house for Thanksgiving, and you know you've got several different voter party registrations represented at that table. Or you've got several different football teams represented at that table. Or you have hurts and pains and old arguments and old brokenness that sort of hovers in the air at that table. But you invite them anyway and you pray and you tell them that you love them because they're your family. They're your family and we as a body of Christ are a family no matter what the conflict has been, no matter what differences we have, we are a family and we are supposed to be a new creation. I struggled for a time with whether to be ordained a deacon or an elder in the United Methodist Church. And if you'd like to stay for three hours after the service, I can explain to you the differences in the ordination of the deacon and the elder. 
I finally decided I think what I'm being called to be is an elder, and elder has nothing to do with age, does more and more, but uh, elder in the Methodist church doesn't mean that you're older than anybody else, but it means that you are ordained to potentially be the head honcho of a church. So at, after six years here at Boston Avenue, I was called by my district superintendent who said, we have a church for you. Because we say, here I am, Lord, send me, and we can be sent anywhere in the state of Oklahoma. And I always worried, where am I going to get sent? What, what if you look at the map and go, what if that place happens to me? What if I wind up over there? What if I wind up down here? But two district, district superintendents were sharing a cell phone, my, my old one and my new one. And the old one said, we're sending you to St. Stephen's in Norman. I know this will shock and disappoint about half of you, but I had never been to Norman in my life. <laughs> Except once when Kathy had a flute contest and I went along and there's a picture of me standing in front of Ken's Pizza that day while she was having her flute contest. So that was my experience with Norman. I knew nothing about the town. And my new district superintendent said, this is a reconciling church. Are you okay with that? And of course she said, I'm okay with whatever. Yes, ma'am, yes, sir, I'm okay. So this was a congregation there in Norman that had been on the left end of things from Vietnam days on and back again. If there was a stand to be taken, the congregation of Norman, of St. Stephen's Norman, was probably going to be to the left of center on it. That's sort of the character of those people and that congregation, and that makes them who they are. And as much as we did talk about certain issues at times, and the big issue that you hear about with St. Stephen's is that in being reconciling, that means it is uh, officially open and affirming of gays, lesbians, bisexuals, and transgendered people. That was an issue that we talked about sometimes, but most of the time, we just did church. We just did church. I came up with a sermon every Sunday that sometimes was like Kathy saying, make it up as you go along. <laughs> and other times I slaved away at it. We visited in the hospitals. We had children's choirs. We had three bell choirs by the time I left. We took care of the aged. We caroled in the nursing homes. We did Pentecost. We did Lent. We did ordinary time. We did Christmas. We only had three services on Christmas Eve, but still, we did Christmas. We baptized babies. We baptized teenagers. We baptized middle-aged people. We baptized elderly people. We did church most of the time, but sometimes there was a crossroads when it was time to take a stand, or stand up and speak, or sign something, or be present somewhere. And you better believe that I sweated drops of blood every time we came to one of those crossroads where I said, what is the best choice here for me as a follower of Christ? What is the best choice here for me not to lose my job? What is the best choice here for me to preserve my integrity? And what is the best choice here for me to be in ministry to the people that the bishop sent me to take care of. So one of those crossroads was a September evening in 2009 when someone had made a proposal to the city council of Norman that we make October LGBT History Month. Now normally I did not go to the city council meetings, but I'm enough of a nerd that I would watch it the next day on television <laughs> and see what had happened. The mayor was in my congregation and I really wanted to see what Dr. Rosenthal had done as she presided over these meetings. It was usually the usual suspects you'd see in the background behind the podium of that one camera they had for the meetings. And it's usually about 15 people sort of scattered around this small assembly room. Not the night we discussed the October proposal. Would have thought we were talking about something controversial, the way the room was packed and people were sitting in hard plastic chairs outside the room. It was hot in there. It was sweaty in there. Or maybe it was just I was sweaty in there, but the room was thick with fear and with anger and with bad feeling. And even though the mayor had set out, as we discuss this issue, we will respect one another. We will remain uh, respectful of the time schedule. We'll do one speech for, one speech against, 
and there will be no clapping, there will be no jeering, there will be no any of that stuff. Well, guess what? There was clapping and there was jeering, and there were words that were inappropriately used. There were a lot of people who said, I'm a Christian, and then they would swing a fist and say words that were hot and hateful, and I'm not talking just about the people who disagreed with where I was coming from. Everybody started to lose it after a while. This meeting went on almost three hours. I knew I had to stand up and say something. I couldn't figure out what to say, but I finally decided what I would say, and I found an opening, and I walked up to that podium, and I put my hands on the podium, and they just sort of slid down the podium. I was so nervous, but I said my name, Ward 2, you had to say where you lived, and said that I was the pastor of St. Stephen's United Methodist Church. And I said, in everything we do and say tonight, I want us to just remember the children of our community, both children who have come out and children who might happen to have two moms or two dads. Let's just remember those precious children that are growing up in our community 11 or 10 of them who go to my church. Thank you very much. And I turned, and in what seemed like an eternity, I heard someone go, and I heard, and as I got about halfway up the aisle, this woman with little Coke bottle glasses and long brown hair pulled back in a ponytail, leaned out of the aisle and said, we know who you are. I know you know who I am. I said who I was. <laughs> but then as I went to bed that night, I thought, she knows who I am. <laughs> she knows where I live. She knows where I work. And I joke about it, but there were a few nights when I went to bed thinking, I, I hope this isn't the night. That next morning, we woke up to read that one of the youth who was at that meeting, who heard all of this back and forth, took his own life in the night one more lost to suicide. That's not what we're about here, people. Be ye reconciled to one another, even if we all in the room disagree with everything every other person is saying. Can we not find a way to just get along? Can we not find a way to accept one another's positions, even if we don't understand them? Can we not find a way to respect opinions that are different from our own. I guess I've been so spoiled, having gone to general conference one time and then annual conference so many times, when we do, as far as I remember, pretty much, adhere to those rules. No clapping, no jeering, no hissing, no clucking of the tongue. No, I disagree with this bird brain who just finished speaking. No, if you do that at one of these big Methodist meetings, you get the gavel or you get the vaudeville cane, you're out of there. Your time is up, no more for you, you must sit down. We respect where each other is coming from. The issue I've just talked about is only one of many completely inflammatory issues I could bring up today that Methodists have arm wrestled over for so many years. If you don't know what the Methodist Church believes, this is a commercial break actually, I invite you to, after you get out of service, don't be doing it now on your phone, but after you get out of the service, look up, you could just Google social principles and find out, we also have it in the library, in the library, anyway, or you should, should have it in the library. This is the stuff that every four years you get the newspaper articles on. These are the big issues in life, like nuclear war, like alcohol and tobacco, like euthanasia, like the death penalty, we have stances on every controversial issue you could think of. And somehow, we keep staying the Methodist Church, we keep coming back together for these big meetings, and we argue and we deliberate, but for the most part, we respect each other's opinions. I have a feeling if we went out here into the West parking lot and I made everybody stand on a line, we do this game with youth sometimes, and sometimes with brave adults, if we played the line game on the social principles, it would be very interesting. At one end of the line, you say, I completely disagree. And at the other end of the line, it's, I completely agree. And we would throw out something like, I believe there should be a death penalty. 
So if you completely disagree, you stand over here. If you completely agree, you stand over here. And if you're in the gray area, you stand somewhere on the line. You're kind of this way, but a little bit this way. And then we talk, well, why did you stand there? How do you, why do you feel about, why do you feel that way? I have a feeling if I did that with everybody here who's in the sanctuary today, we'd have people all over the line on that issue and others. But for some reason, you still come back here to worship and you still love one another and you still do all those great things that I read about you doing in the newsletter and that my parents tell me that you're doing. You're still doing mission. You're still having Sunday school. You're doing great things with youth. You're embracing a new pastor who's kind of new but not really new. You're adapting to new things. You're reaching out into the world. And you know you all disagree on all kinds of stuff. Why can we not be reconciled to one another and say, I'm not where you are on that. I've come to a different position. But I love you, and I'm still going to bring you a casserole when you have a death in your family. And I'm still going to sit with you in church, and we're going to not fuss about this kind of stuff. Recently, I was at a luncheon where Dr. Jocelyn Payne spoke. She's the executive director of the John Hope Franklin Center for Reconciliation here in Tulsa. She was an excellent speaker, and whenever I hear an excellent speaker, I pull out my pen and I start writing stuff down. What I didn't mention is that <clears throat> a few Sundays a month while I've been on sabbatical this year, I have driven up to Chelsea, Oklahoma, which is just past Claremore if you don't know where it is, but up to Chelsea because they ran out of pastors and they needed somebody at the, well, Presbyterian Church. <laughs> so, you know they're debtors up there. <laughs> they're not trespassers anyway. So I've been, <laughs> I've been debting all year and it feels great. Um, anyway, I go up there and the congregation has, on a big day, 20. So I'm a little freaked out right now. Um, 20 in the congregation and occasionally at least one of those people is related to me. So it's a small congregation, but I still have to come up with a sermon. And when I was recruited to do this job, the person who recruited me said, you got a million sermons and files. And I have some sermons and files, but they just never quite fit. They never quite work. So I'm still out there with my pen. Ooh, that was good. I can use that sometime soon. Well, Dr. Payne talked about how Tulsa used to be a very different place. If you're among the oldest among us, you remember how different it used to be and how far we've come as far as racial interaction goes and peace in that way, peace and justice. But you know, we still have a long way to go. All you need to do is read the newspaper to find that out. And she asked us a few rhetorical questions such as, how would things look different if we were somehow all reconciled? How would things look different if we were actually all completely reconciled to one another? What if we all just acknowledged that we're all a part of the human race? What if we all just acknowledged that we're all just a part of the human race? What if we all just acknowledged that we're all planted in God's garden? Sermon series. We're all planted in God's garden and we can either be a weed and choke out the good life of the good plants. We can be a dandelion and get tall and puffy and blow all over the place, leaving our little nettles so that more dandelions will grow and choke out the good soil. Or we can try to be a good plant. We can shade others where we can. We can soak up our water like good little roots. What if we all just acknowledge that we're all part of God's garden? We're all part of the human race. And she said, I find that when we have a commonality, when two people find a commonality, whether it's African-American person, Anglo person sitting down to talk, or an older person and a younger person, or a wealthy person and an impoverished person, when we find a place of commonality, that's where those boundaries start breaking down. And at this luncheon, she said, I've seen so many of you now with your iPhones pulling up pictures of this is my latest grandchild and this is my garden that I've planted and have you seen the new fence that we put up and so on. And then the other person says, I have grandchildren too. Check mine out. Check out my thing, my new interest. When we share that we both have grandchildren, we both have similar interests. 
We both, you went to that school, I went to that school. There are a bunch of people in this congregation today that I was in the youth choir with. I don't know what you're doing here, but it's great to see ya. <laughs> Alan Bingham's about to fall out of the balcony on the front row. <laughs> Joe Simmons is here. Okay, Paula, I could go on and on about her. The bravest teenager I ever knew is here. When we, we have those shared memories and those shared roots, it draws us all together. I don't know if the four of us could get into a really big debate and angry conversation about all the things we disagree on, but let's not do it, okay? Let's not do that. Let's just continue to be friends and love one another as we have done. We have something in common. We were all in the youth choir at Boston Avenue and that helped made it make us who we are today. My uncle died a year ago, the day after Easter. He was a retired pastor, and he had one of the finest funerals I've ever been to. It went on and on. He had planned it himself, and all the words that were spoken were carefully lined out by him. Uh, people he chose to, spoke before he to speak before he died were well chosen. They were well spoken. At the end, in the reception hall, an African-American woman came up to my mother and said, I'm so sorry that you've lost your husband. My mother said, oh, oh no, I, I'm the sister-in-law. It was my brother-in-law who died. She said, so your husband is still alive? And she said, well, yeah, he's right over there. She said, I hope you throw your arms around your husband and love him every day. You tell him that you love him. You tell him that you appreciate him because my husband is gone and I can't do that anymore. That ceased to be a situation of a black woman talking to a white woman. That was two women in their 70s who had been married a very long time, who were grieving a person to whom they were related in different ways, but who had been on the same journey of long time marriage and those realities that come with age. Wasn't a black woman talking to a white woman it was a woman talking to another woman about some of the heartbreak that's involved in this life that we get to lead. That's a pretty tame example, but when we have a commonality, we have something to share, we realize we're both on this path together. We're all on this path together. We don't agree, we don't always get along, but we love one another. And we're stuck, for better or worse, in this beautiful garden that is God's. The youth gave the sermon this morning. I mean, they didn't really, but the anthem that they gave was the sermon as far as I was concerned. Take our many ways of working, blend the colors of each soul into a rainbow. Give us life, Lord, make us whole. <laughs>